accessing the international market. The UK is not particularly welcoming to uh, folk from overseas at the moment. I struggle every year to recruit overseas students uh, because the, the barriers that the UK government uh, in its current hostility and its, in its inward looking outlook uh, is putting in people's way. So we had a fantastic program that we had a fantastic program um, uh, for, uh, food security, food and water security had over 100 recruits, uh, potential recruits every year from Africa, many from Nigeria, many uh, recruited by my colleague, uh, Dr. Akam. None of them could come. None of them could come. It tackled the challenges that we were trying to face, but none of them could come. Uh, and that's typical of us year on year. This year, I had 80 applications for students from Africa. None of them could come. But there is a life-changing opportunity, a life-changing experience that's available. So, Akan there got his chance because he, ha he has his degree from Nigeria. We'll tell you a bit about that later. He got a Commonwealth scholarship to Aberystwyth University. We're only able to award one of those a year. But Akan, has, that's a life-changing experience for him. He's gone on to do uh, great things. Now, there are solutions to this, and we need to work together to find those. So this is uh, a young lady from the uh, University of Addo Akiti. She's a faculty member there. She has a master's degree. Uh, she's now working at Aberystwyth to do a PhD in antibiotic research on uh, the plants that's uh, growing next to her. And the name of that slipped off the slide and I can't remember it to read to you. Now, um, we have developed a program here uh, that, that facilitates uh, uh, this young lady getting a PhD. It's a split site PhD. So to reduce the cost, to reduce the fees, all of those things. So uh, she spent her first year in Amaris with engage, engaging in fundamental research training, went back to her, her host university doing fundamental uh, work on the, on the plan she was going to research, and then has returned to Amaris for her third year to conduct that research. And she is doing amazing things. She's potentially identifying uh, new, new antibiotics. And she's not in the room, but I'd like to give her a round of applause. <laughs> She is wonderful. In, 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 you know, in, in a room full of PhD students, in, a, in an auditorium full of PhD students, I put her in the top ten. Wow. And this is a research institute that recruits from all over the world. So phenomenal, phenomenal opportunity, phenomenal talent, and finding ways of releasing them. And that's why, I'm, that's why I've made the journey here. Uh, to Nigeria today. Here's another lady, again from Addo Ekiti University, doing exactly the same thing, uh, again uh, looking at a particular uh, plant, but looking for drugs which will be suitable for use in, in, in Africa. And this is, this is, you know, to say the tip of the iceberg is not the appropriate uh, uh, metaphor, because it's, a, it's, it's bigger than that. The potential that's locked up here is phenomenal, and we need to help uh, we need to help you, work with you to release that because these people will come back, they will, she, these, these ladies will come back with PhDs to this university, fully trained research scientists, engaged in research that's going to change people's lives, save people's lives, and they're going to make a difference. And they will be centres of excellence within that university. Yeah? And that's what we've got to do. We've got to, we've got to release that talent and create these opportunities because these folk will inspire the people that they're teaching and the next generation. And that really is where we've got to go. We've got to look at things like distance learning. And I know you've got a great sense for distance learning here. We have to learn from you how to engage in that. Because our, to deliver distance learning from the UK into Africa, frankly, is daft. We want to, we want to deliver these programs and these sciences, but we need to deliver them with, a, with partners. We need to deliver them with partners because the day-to-day -day support needs to be provided in country. And so, again, we need to speak to you like that. So I hope you get from what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a colonial smash and grab, right? We've done that. Uh, and, 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 you know, and we've got to do better. We've got to do better. And this is a way of doing better. And it's a way of releasing uh, talent. So these are just two of the uh, distance learning programs that we're putting in place. And these are, I think, absolutely uh, appropriate for, for Nigeria. Agriculture and the environment, uh, industrial biotechnology, food and water security. What, is, what could be possibly be wrong with those? But as well as this, we've got things like information management, 
You know, there's, there's a vast range that we need to look at, but it has to be colleagues and friends. It has to be really, really, really high quality. Because otherwise, we are, we are not delivering what we're, we're meant to do with these programs, which is, again, to release people's potential and allow them to change people's lives, to be centres of excellence, one by one, as we go forward. So we need to make that, uh, and, and I just wanted to put up an illustration of some of the folk who are engaging in this at the moment. So we've got Alan there at the, at the top, uh, top left, who's looking at uh, uh, livestock. Uh, she's from Uganda. Uh, the next we've got Elizabeth uh, from Kenya. We've got a vet from Ecuador. Uh, we've got somebody from Colombia at the bottom, and then we've got uh, Betty Kennedy in the top, bottom right-hand corner here, who's a lecturer from Papua New Guinea. Right, and we're working very, very hard with these to try and deliver as near as we can the experience you would get if you were in the lecture theatre, if you were back in Aberystwyth. Now, it's not easy to do by distance learning. That is why we need to partner with collaborators who share our mission, who share our passion. I think you do. And there are other things we can do. So we can, we can break down qualifications so you can do them bit by bit by bit. Why, why do you have to take 120 credits at once? Let's look at ways in which you can develop your skills and facilities as you go forward. Uh, and you'll see at the bottom, uh, and on the right-hand side, there's something we're calling the professional doctorate. Uh, and so in the environmental terms, we've got a doctorate in a, a DAG. Uh, that's not meant to be there. Right, so professional doctorate. This, again, is something we're trying to develop in Aberystwyth University. And the professional doctorate is slightly different to the classic PhD. There are, I'm sure there are people in this slides who've got a master's qualification, in, in this room who've got a master's qualification, who want to do a PhD, and you'd quite like to do one uh, based uh, around a, a, a UK-based uh, education. It's very hard to give up your life and your career and disrupt your family and move everybody to the UK. It's, it's, it's very, very, very difficult. But we have to recognise that professional people have got more to offer, and they've got life experiences and all sorts of skills. So it may be that we can do something different and something better that's more appropriate for professional people. And this is the professional PhD. And so the model we're developing is that you come to Aberystwyth for a few weeks, three weeks, uh, three times for two years, three week blocks, and you develop research training. You develop the research training skills. Because we all think we can do statistics, we all did it at, at, at undergraduate level, but we learned it, passed the exam, and then we forgot it. You, you own up, you all did the same, yeah? You all did the same. So you, you get the research training in blocks, but your research is about changing workplace practice. It can be about, uh, it can be, so, so some of the examples that we're looking at at the moment are people looking at, at changing safety regimes in nuclear power stations, about changing financial regulations, about changing the way that the transport system operates in Dubai. So professional knowledge, and, and you take the, the, your PhD is relevant to your professional environment. It's a very powerful mechanism, and you do that for PhD, you do your thesis back at base with a supervisor here and a supervisor back in Aberystwyth. And we're finding that to be very popular. So we've recruited already this first year 50 people onto this program. Uh, so, and, and they've come from uh, economies in the Gulf, basically, where, where like Nigeria, they have a reliance on a single uh, product, which is oil. So the government there is trying to uh, diversify and stabilise the economy by encouraging people to go and take this qualification. So we're trying to do that. We're trying to do something similar for education. So to develop educational educationalist standards, pedagogy, so you can do a, 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 a doctorate in education in the same way. And as you, if you saw the prior, if you took note of the accolades we've had recently, again, we're somebody you could talk to about that because we are leading in the UK in the development of these pedagogies. So professional PhD is something that I really want to be able to talk to you here about because that colleagues could be released from here for a few weeks at a time. It's relatively easy to get your, your visa for that uh, exchange. And then uh, as the collaboration develops, we will be coming backwards and forwards. So a personal note uh, from me uh, to finish. This is me uh, a few weeks ago in Cardigan Bay. Uh, and so in my free time, I do triathlons and I love swimming. The gift of triathlon, the, the Lord has gifted me the ability to swim. And so in the background, you can just see the, 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 the houses in Aberystwyth. Okay, I have an amazing life. I am the grandson of coal miners, right? Uh, as I drove here today, I saw people on motorbikes with a courier bag, a courier box on the side. Have you, have you seen those motorcycle couriers? You must have seen those. You probably use them. 
Until I was 26 years old, colleagues, I was a motorcycle courier. Right? And somebody gave me a chance. Somebody made this life that I lead today possible. There is no way that any careers advisor or any headmaster could have plotted my life to be standing in front of you today. I've become an expert in how to be effective teaching. I do really significant research. I do research on the impact of volcanic eruptions on the environment. And I advise now the British government when there's an eruption about to, to uh, take off in Iceland, typically. Uh, they phone me wherever I am. Indeed, a few years ago, I was in the Outer Hebrides on an island with no mobile phone coverage. And I knew from the radio that there was an Icelandic volcanic eruption about to take off. And the government was able to ring me on my phone. So everything you know about government, everything you've heard about government and information technology in the movies looks like it's true because they were able to make my phone ring when there wasn't even a mast on the island. University, when we boil it down, is about releasing people's potential. We all have that passion for it. I have that passion for it. It's in here. It's not something I've learned. It's something I've always carried with me. Uh, one, uh, when I was trying to go to university, I was just phoning up universities because I didn't even know how to apply. Here I am, 26 years old. Can I come? Go away working class rookie. Uh, you know, we've got no space for somebody like you. Uh, go and do some A-levels and come back in a few years' time. Not an option for me. I had, uh, you know, I had one. All the, all the things, all the trappings of modern life, I couldn't give those up. But one university gave me a chance. Made this life possible. Made this moment possible. And I think that's what we in this room are all about. And that's what Nigeria can do. So thank you very much for listening to me. And then we now came up with the 25 year strategic plan for the university. The mission of the university was revealed, saying that I should be the university, top class university, in relation to um, knowledge, in relation to character, and in relation to uh, interaction with the community. And if you look at what is happening globally, we need to look at what we are going to use to drive the vision. And what was decided on then was that to drive the vision, you need a conducive environment where the students, where the staff can interact effectively, and where they are the best who can come out of this, and they will be able to compete locally and globally. That now linked me to the university, university service mission, that is to enable the university to achieve its best objective by providing effective support to students, staff, and ensuring that the university human, physical, financial, and information resources are well managed and the university committed to learning research infrastructure that uh, advances the university academic authority, assemble frontline services that meet all student needs, administrative services that are customized, customer focused, and effective, and the service of uh, culture that is accountable. And what is the University of Lagos about? The University of Lagos is about delivering excellent research, providing an excellent student experience, extending global reach and reputation, that is for the university to be rooted in Nigeria and globally recognized. And also, we look at the staff. If you look at what was written by Jim Mill, when he was talking about the world class university, these are people who are now saying that we are not talking about world class university, we are talking about success intensive university. Now, we look at the shift in paradigm. World class.
class university, success intensive university. When you are talking about success intensive university, you are looking at the third realm of the uh, relevance of university. Talk about the relevance of university, you are talking about the teaching, research, community, development. What are we doing in relation to the community? And that was how they, they came up with the issue of success intensive university. And the processes and systems needed for you to get to that level include the infrastructure, financial plan, analysis of key risk. Say something about the vision, the mission. What are the core values needed for us to arrive at this? Then the core values needed include developing human resources to serve the nation, recognizing teaching as a unifying activity, nurturing integrity, creativity, and academic freedom, retaining a willingness to experience with new paradigms. And we look at the, I don't want to bore you with the history of the University of Lagos. We all know that the university started in 1962 by the Act of Parliament, and that gave us the power to be able to actuate uh, the government of Nigeria when they wanted to change the name of the university. Because this is the only university that was set up by the Act of Parliament in 1962. So to change the name of the University of Lagos, you have to go to the House of Parliament or you go to Senate, you have to combine Senate and House of Representatives to come up with a law to change the University of Lagos. So the University of Lagos stays and the government left. <laughs> well, that is history for another day. <laughs> Let us look at the structure of the University of Lagos. We have the full-time students, the full-time undergraduate student population now is over 30,000. For postgraduate students, PhD, MSc, PGD is over 10,000. We have the ICT, that is the Institute of Continuing Education, IC, sorry. We also have the Distant Learning Institute. Distant Learning Institute is about roughly uh, 13,000, uh, I see over 1,000. So the total students, the total population of students in the University of Lagos is about 65,000. Now, going to the concept of internationalization. Internationalization is an integral part of the continuous process of a change in higher education. We need to look at the University of Lagos as the hub for West Africa, the hub for Africa, before we now go to the other part of the continent. Internationalization is not only positive, with what we are experiencing now, there is need for us to look outward, not only for us to see ourselves as local champions. I tell people one thing, you compare yourself with yourself, you have not done anything. But when you compare yourself with people that are doing well, then you'll be able to achieve something. So what do we need to do as the university of first choice, as the nation's pride? We need to cut a niche for ourselves as a university. We cut the niche for ourselves. What do I mean by that? We look at our strengths, the flagship, the program that we can say this is University of Lagos when you talk about this particular program. And those programs that we see as not doing well, then we can strengthen those programs. Because one problem that we have now is that we look at only applied science. Let me take applied science, for example, as a scientist. We forget about the pure science. We want to forget about history and talk about strategic policy. But we know that strategy will start from somewhere. It starts from the history that you know about yourself, and with that, you can project into the future. 
So development of Nigerian universities and education is connected with internationalization process of different educational aspects, research activities. As I said earlier on in my speech, I representing the BC, because this is Tony Ogudu for the time here now, not the Vice Chancellor, Professor Rama Adisabedu. When you talk about research, you are talking about collaboration, as like I said, talking about collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. You don't need to look at yourself rooted in Nigeria, not known globally. You must be rooted in Nigeria and be rooted and be known globally. Development of Nigerian university education is connected with this internationalization process of different educational aspects and research activities. And we are talking about innovation. Without the research, there cannot be innovation. And without innovation, there cannot be entrepreneurship. And in the process, you cannot have what we call patenting. And we are this university, the direction this university is going on now is about patenting, which we have not had before. And how do we arrive at this? Is by collaborating with our colleagues within the university and outside the university and at the international level. What are the strategic goals for comprehensive internationalization? Both global, build, we have to build global consciousness through international education. When we go for conferences out of this country, how do we relate with our colleagues that we met when we come back to Nigeria? Coming back to Nigeria, you just forget about them. What I do as a person is that when I come back from any conference that I've attended, some of those people I send emails to them to let them know that I have arrived by country for them not to think that I have another Andrew that left Nigeria for greener pasture where there is no pasture. So I get in touch with them, send them and back to Nigeria, and I keep on sending email messages to them occasionally. I find that they will respond. With that, to be able to build that relationship with your colleagues outside the country. You have to strengthen and assess students' global competency, increase opportunities for self-awareness, and identify development in a global context. We, we have to keep on assessing. Go, not, we don't need to just use our internet to assess our email. We need to look at opportunities that are available. If from the, our colleague he can come here, if he calls, the opportunity is there. And if you look at that report from concerning the World Competitiveness uh, Index, there is need for us in Africa to know that it is the up now. Many of our colleagues in the US, in Europe, they want to come to Africa because this is where it's happening now. And on their own, they cannot do it. On our own, they cannot do it. So there is need for us to stretch our hands and they stretch in their hands, and we have to touch it together. Then we need to look at the curriculum. There is need for us to look at the curriculum that we are running now. Is our curriculum teaching oriented or learning oriented? Like somebody who came here now, that when he was abroad, they, they are having projects, they are having that interaction. But over here is a uh, book, book, book. You just load it on them. And by the time you even give them the test for them to attend to, yeah, it's another problem. So we need to move away from teaching platform to learning platform. Increase the engagement of international EUs in coursework, expand opportunities to diverse uh, perspectives on course things, a diverse global community as investor of neighbors. We need to develop diverse international residential communities. That means for us to look at the possibilities, like our colleague from um, our state, we need to attract the undergraduate students from that place. Like I told the pro vice chancellor, that we have the scholars posted, and I will be happy to see him coming back. To say that I want to come and give a lecture, I want to come around 
to give his lecture, to interact, to have collaboration, and stay there for one month. And we can also go there for one month. That is what we mean by a win-win affair. We need to provide opportunities and recognition for increased global engagement by faculty and uh, staff. What are the strategic goals as I continue? Increase collaboration with unilag diverse community resources. We boast that we are the only university in Nigeria that is lagoon bound. No other university in this country. What do we do about that? Our university came from Portugal and the, the Minister of Science and Tech said he went through the literature concerning the University of Lagos and he found that it's the only university that is waterbound. And because of that, they took interest in the University of Lagos. And that is the reason why they want to enter into strong collaboration with us. So we need to look at our environment and use it to our advantage to market ourselves. International students' enrollment. What do we do about that? That's need for us to look inward. I think I did that when I was the dean of the School of Postgraduate Studies. I was able to attract somebody from Canada. And even despite the fact that I was a uh, staff, um, uh, I don't want to say all right. I was uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, around that time, we have this, um, our, uh, not, we have our strike that time. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, we, still, we are still able to accommodate that um, guy that came from Canada within one year. What we did was that while we are having that break, he was carrying out his uh, research work. So when we resume, we continue with the coursework and then uh, Professor Adeliki, then Dr. Adeliki was the one that anchored the program. We need to uh, attract international students to come to the University of Lagos. And that was why I said we must act as the hub for West Africa, the hub for Africa. We need to go out and market the University of Lagos. These people can come from Ghana to market their own university of Ghana. Nigerian University, I beg both to say they are better than the best university in Ghana. Mm -hmm. They must have been there to do their presentation, and I know what I'm talking about. We need to develop a set of resources for faculty and staff traveling abroad. Yes, I think for us to review that issue, we have by at least to know that the person will have the travel grants and uh, will be able to do better and not the one that will take you to the airport and whether you come back or not. Develop effective global and local communication skills. That's need for us to do that. Prepare to them for global workforce. We need to prepare our students to have that soft ethic, to be able to think globally and to be able to be incisive in the way they think. Support international travel of students faculty and staff. There are people that want to support that, but we need to attract them. There are companies that want to support um, the traveling of staff, traveling of students. We need to attract them and provide risk mitigation um, training and support for international travelers. Then the international content for university education. As I said, the foreign students, we have to attract them to come to the University of Lagos. This is one of the stable uh, university, I mean, with stable calendar in the, in the country. The reason why I'm saying this is that in the University of Lagos, we have less of internal problems. Any problem we have in the University of Lagos is a national one. But internal one, the management of the University of Lagos is always able to be proactive and thank God for the union that we have that they are also interested in the progress of the university. Research collaboration, I've said that, exchange and linkage uh, programs is needed, and uh, sabbatical leave. It's unfortunate that some of us want to go to sabbatical leave for our own sabbatical leave. We think about the money, especially when we are growing up in the system. There is need for us to think about what we are going to gain when we go there, and what we are going to bring back 
when you go for your sabbatical leave. And then we need to look at the issue, the management in the vice catalog, said it on several fora. Uh, if you are postdoctoral, postdoctoral, so invite people from outside the country to come for their postdoctoral in the US of Labor. Funding from donor agency. Recently, the Air Investigation Bureau, AIB, came to the University of Lagos and they said that they have a lot of funds for research, but there's no university that is uh, interested. So we told them that we are interested. So there are so many of these agencies in Nigeria that they have the grant that they want to award for people who have expressed interest. Apart from that, globally, globally, there are a lot of research grants available. That is why we have the Research and Innovation Office. The Research and Innovation Office is to assist us to prepare our, our proposal so that we'll be able to meet the donor's demand. And of recent, I think Professor Oyene, I don't know if she's here, and some other people were called, they were invited to come and write proposal uh, in one area. And presently, in my office, the office of the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic and Research, we have people that are writing proposal now based on the need or the request from the uh, one of these oil companies that they want to set up a uh, center of excellence in any university that is able to come up with a winning proposal. There are a lot of uh, research opportunities available in Nigeria and globally too. The issue of communication. The one I want to lay emphasis on here is about soft skills. We need to let our teach our students concerning the issue of soft skills. And that we can also invite further by having the incubation center. The university already we have incubation center, which we are going to expand in such a way that our students will be able to apply that soft skills and be able to compete within the country and globally. The challenges of uh, internal, internationalization, and somebody said that when you go for a visa, they will not give you a visa. Uh, it's part of the problem that we have. Um, some uh, policies of assault, funding, security challenge, war infrastructure. Uh, in the University of Lagos, uh, it's very expensive to have this constant power that we have if you come. Look at how much the government is releasing for uh, the same purpose. It's not the money the government is releasing cannot take us uh, more than two months. But with the way we run the university, we are able to the university is able to uh, fund uh, the issue of power. There are some universities that maybe they will say they are, they are giving you power for three hours, four hours. But the university of Lagos is still better. Globalization. Globalization is the way. And how do you get yourself connected to globalization? I've said it, it's about collaboration. When you collaborate, your colleagues outside the country can invite you to come and make use of their facility. When I do this, that our colleagues want to travel abroad and come back with a new car, a new jeep. Those days are gone. Because the Oingo man that wants to give you their money, they want to make sure that that money can only take you from your apartment to your lab, you take your lunch, you take your breakfast, and maybe you have to skip one so that you can buy something when you are coming back. <laughs> what are the importance of um, internationalization? Profiling and branding. We talk, we talk about ranking. The ranking of the university is based on this criteria for ranking, very important. Enhancement of international uh, cooperation. Also, we talk about international grants, support by IOC, Indo, AAU, solution to bring green. When I was the dean of PG school, the School of Program Studies, the University of Europe, they always say, talk about publish or perish. And I always talk about publish and flourish. That is the direction. I don't want anybody to perish. I want everybody to flourish. And how do you flourish is by publishing. 
key benefits of uh, this internationalization. One, international exposure to best uh, practices. It is sad that in, Africa, in Nigeria, there is no laboratory in Nigeria that is of international standards. The ISO cannot come to any laboratory in Nigeria and say, well, we can give you a certificate. But I want to assure you that the university is looking at that direction and we definitely attend to that within the next six months. High intensity exposure of lecturers is one of the ways through which we can improve the skill of our, our academic staff. Ranking, rating, and branding. University of Lagos is a good brand. It's a brand that we can post off. But Coca-Cola is making lots of sales, but they are still marketing and they are still rebranding. So the same thing, University of Lagos, we need to continue to brand and rebrand. I know that from here we can talk about the center of excellence. Like I told you before, people want to come to the University of Lagos, even outside the country, rather than going to other universities. We need to diversify and enhance the learning environment. I've said it before, we need to move away from teaching environment to learning environment. So that whatever our students learn, they will be able to take it far. But whatever you teach them, they just crown, they will give it back to you, and they will say back to sender. Producing graduates who are of international standards who can uh, interact well with their colleagues. Not those ones that when they go outside the country and they show them like electron microscope. I remember the first time I saw an electron microscope was when I was doing my PhD. And I looked at it and said, wow. So, but now this facility is available. At IITA, they have what we call the uh, for a sequencing machine. So in Nigeria, universities that are very close to IITA, you just go to IITA with uh, your relationship with them and school your students to the facilities that are here, that you have here in Nigeria. I'm reading the international profile of the university, the University of Lagos. There is need for us to upload our publications. That is need for us to upload our presentations. When we go for any conference abroad, you must upload it to the UNILAC website. Even your questions, if you know your questions are really of international standard, upload your question, upload your answer, marking, your marking scheme. It's very important. This, if you go to, let me give you an example. I don't know if there's anybody from Covenant University here. You go to the website of Covenant University after leaving this place. All this you will see their uh, website and that is why they have that high rank rating. We need to strengthen research and knowledge production and uh, uh, research co collaboration. During the last 25 years, the strategy includes identifying the following broad targets. Becoming, we need to become a leading technological uh, university. Rank in the global top 50 in all disciplines. Apart from the university ranking, that's what they call the impact ranking, and that's another one they call the faculty ranking. Every all the days in the faculty must make sure that their faculty and their faculty members they upload the information they have. Even their CV, some of us don't have their, our CV online. We need to become globally competitive and like I said earlier on, we have the incubation center. The incubation center is to prepare our students so that they will not see the broad world, they will not look at the local content only, but they will see the, the world, the way the world is, and they will be able to apply themselves to what is going on outside. We need to provide an invigorating, invigorating work environment for faculty and staff. If you are inviting anybody from now, outside the country to come and stay here for six months. Like I said, the scholar hostel is there. We need to provide a good office for that person and there is need for us uh, to interact with them. We must not interact with them based on the fact that we, don't, we want them to invite 
us to their own university and no, we need to interrupt them based on our our exposure, on our research, on the, our research and things like that. So when you I mean, interact with them based on your research work, just like I'm telling John now that one of my students is working on plants that are used in treating uh, treating snake bite. And you know they said something about the, the plant that they are extracting active ingredients ingredient from. So with that, I continue with that discussion with him. And definitely, those people who are working there connect me to those people. And we'll continue with that uh, discussion. So we don't see it as if you want to gain, you just want to exploit the uh, discussion. No, it should be such that you will present yourself showing that you are doing the research work in a particular area that is relevant to the need of that uh, university. We have to expand and promote the study and use of world language at the University of Lagos. That we do, uh, you know, we are the only, the first university to start teaching Chinese language uh, in Nigeria. And, uh, we also have the Confucius Institute. So there is need for some of us, especially the young ones, to go there and learn Chinese, not to spare spare part but for academic purposes. <laughs> The process of achieving the Unilag 25 uh, year strategic plan, academic content, I've said it, the view of ICT, we need to be visible. Uh, we are not that visible now, and the CITS people are working on that. We need to be visible so that people will know what is going on in the University of Lagos. And from our own side, too, please let us upload our CV. Let us upload our publication. Let us make ourselves visible. So that if there's somebody now from our colleagues in university that wants to work with anybody, maybe in adult education, you just Google the name, look at the University of Lagos, see the person, know your area of specialization, and that is how discussions will be initiated. Uh, continue with that, uh, I want to run up. What will be the measurable outcomes, that is the key performance uh, indicators? The quality of employable graduates, interview-wise, job rating, then the international certificate result publication in conferences, journals. We should move away from, um, honestly speaking, once we are at um, the senior lecturer level, move away from poster presentation conferences. You move away from poster. It's meant for the younger ones. But at senior lecturer level upward, move away from poster presentation. Make sure you compete with those people that are going to make an oral presentation. Um, international student participation, like I have said something about that, that the university is doing something about that. Uh, student day call is being renovated. And uh, I think it's two in a room, self-contained. This is part of what we are doing uh, on that. But I went to the student, international student, they come around, they will have their own uh, two in a room, and the facilities are there. Quality control, which is very important, conducive learning environment, admission process, selection of lecturers, courses, course material, multimedia projector, and uh, cost evaluation, release of results, and all these things. You see six key activities describing internationalization of research at the university. One, articulate, articulated commitment, academic offerings, organizational infrastructure, external funding. External funding, even if it is $2,000, attract it. Because if you want to attract $20,000, they will ask you, have you ever managed any grant before? If you have not managed, I remember somebody that came and said, I want to apply for a research grant of $4 million. I asked him, have you managed one before? He said, no. I said, ah, shoot, yes, I do. Because for them to give you the research grant of $4 million, it means that they will, shoot, they will want to see your record. They want to look at the way you are able to manage um, 
something that is less than that. So there is no agency that will just give you four million dollars like that. International investment in across programs. In conclusion, Unilab 25 years strategic plan set out specific targets in every sphere of activity of the university, academic programs, research, collaboration with industry, human resource development, entrepreneurship, development of infrastructure and facilities, student life, placement, community outreach, international and alumni relations. Let me look at, apart from this, this generating grants or fund through the start grants, also the alumni is very important very key because we are proud today that the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, an alumnus of the University of Lagos, uh, lecturer at the University of Lagos before he migrated to the political platform. So that we can flout that, the governor of the state, that we can flout. And things like that will definitely affect the rating of the university. The target will likely be exceeded if the contributions of stakeholders, I think you and myself, faculty, staff, students, alumni, international partners and collaborators from industry are aligned and reinforce each other. The vision outlined in the plan will then be realized. I want to thank you for listening. God bless you. Uh, nutrition, uh, not just uh, the amount of food, but also the quality of the diet, and doing so in a way in which, in the, face, in the face of climate change, actually protects the natural resources of, in the case of IIT, Sub-Saharan Africa. And we do that very much through partnerships. We've been hearing a lot about partnerships already today, and clearly for IIT also. You know, we work very much with partners, with collaborators um, in Africa and around the world. And that's just plain what I just said. So where, where we are is, as I said, the headquarters and the Centre for West Africa are in Bali. But we have other centres around Africa, um, primarily um, in East Africa, major centre in, in Tanzania, in Southern Africa, in Lusaka, in Zambia, and in Central Africa, in Bukavu, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But those are just the main centres for those regions. We work in many other countries. We have projects in many other countries. We have scientists in many other countries throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. But of course, and, uh, I shouldn't mention, you'll see the slide there at the top, as I say, 50, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. Uh, we had a major celebration in, in July, uh, which was attended by two former, two former presidents for the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So over that time, obviously, we have developed very special relationships with a number of organizations within Nigeria, and that includes a number of, of universities as well. And we have a strong a commitment to working with the National Agricultural Research System in Nigeria, but also partners within the university as well as the private sector. <coughs> so our strategy and our goal um, up to the period of 2020, um, from about 2010, is to lift another million Africans out of poverty and to do so well. Um, if you like, bringing back 7.5 million hectares of land within uh, sub Saharan Africa into sustainable use. And these are not just targets that we set and then, you know, basically forgotten about, but they are targets which we are monitoring very closely. We have teams um, within IITA who have expertise in these areas are actually looking to see what progress we are making towards those. Um, goals because you'll be aware that these days the major funders of agricultural research are primarily interested in impact 
and they're, in, they're interested in how we can actually demonstrate that uh, impact. So the monitoring and evaluation side of things is very important. Just to break that down a little bit more, we have within IITA, of course, we are primarily obviously concerned with agricultural research. Uh, within that, we have strong um, crop breeding programs, and we have so-called mandate crops, cassava, yam, maize, uh, banana plantain, soybean, cactus. And really, when we look at those crops, and this applies also to other crops that other centers work on, we need to dramatically increase the yield of those crops um, over the next 10 years or more. Certainly, you know, when we start to think about the situation in 2050, we need to see a dramatic increase in the yield of crops. We need to see increase in farm incomes. We need, to obviously, to see reductions in malnourishment and restoration of soil, soil fertility, reduction in land degradation. And so these are somewhat, you may think, challenging targets and the targets which are very much based on, on the needs which will be very apparent, are very apparent now and will become more apparent in the future. And within IIT we work across, as I said, not only crop and biotechnology, but also uh, natural resource management, with a strong focus on, on soil fertility, integrated soil fertility management, Soil science and agribusiness, and I'll come back to this because it's increasingly apparent that we need to be working across the whole value chain within agriculture. We can't just work on production, we need to think about markets, we need to think about how produce gets to markets, how they get to the consumers, how consumers show their preference, and so on, and how agribusiness itself develops plant production and plant health. So now I want to just mention a couple of things which are really informing a lot of the way that IITA and major funding organisations are, are looking at things. Um, I'm sure this will be familiar to you, which is the situation with regard to young people within Africa, with regard to the number of young people and the employment opportunities for young people and particularly in the context of, of agriculture um, and aging um, workforce in terms of actual agricultural production. So it's clear that significant steps need to be taken uh, to try and um, address at least some of the elements of the situation. And another part of that, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with this uh, gentleman who is currently in the US is picking up the World Food Prize um, this week in Des Moines um, in the USA. Uh, obviously, he was formerly Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria. <coughs> he was also formerly working at IITA before that, and uh, he's now the president of the African Development Bank. I'm very much a strong theme of the African Development Bank and other funders, which is transformation that they see necessary in terms of. Uh, really changing agriculture into a business in which all those actors along the value chain um, can make profit in order to make, maintain the sustainability of that value chain to the future and enhance it. In terms of IITA, just as a little uh, illustration really of what we're doing, this is the current situation, the current year 2017. <coughs> Only to IITA within, within Nigeria, which includes um, Ivan itself, but we also have sites in Kano, in Abuja, and in Oni here to, to Port Harcourt. So you can see the numbers that we're getting within terms of MSc and PhD students. So we already have. <coughs> Sorry. I don't know if any of you saw on the news, but recently the British Prime Minister had a very disastrous speech. Like he couldn't cough. He couldn't stop coughing, that's what I'm trying to say. 
Don't you stop, stop saying in a voice, totally faded away. And then the letters behind you start to fall down. No, nothing is falling down behind you anyway. <laughs> That's a good point. And I'm not also involved in trying to pull the UK out of the European Union, so that's another advantage. So, we already have that strong commitment. As I said, we would like to do more, we would like to put things on a more systematic basis, we would like to do more with the University of Lagos, that's why I'm here uh, today. We want to develop also um, plans with the University of Aberystwyth, Aberystwyth University, in terms of split site, PhD, and okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what I also want to talk about, in, in addition to this sort of, um, if you like, slightly more traditional approach, NSV, PhD, IT students, uh, which we really want to, to expand, as I said, to develop research collaborations. I want to talk about uh, the work that we've been doing in terms of youth entrepreneurs. So, this is really something which we've developed in the last five years, it's been set up essentially as a way of dealing with those two key issues which I spoke about, which is the situation with regard to the youth and youth and employment in Nigeria and in Sub-Saharan Africa in general, and also with the need to think about the transformation of agriculture and how it can become more business-like. So the idea is basically a set of groups who are trained, um, who, don't, who, who are graduates but don't have a, an agricultural background necessarily, but who become trained in, in, a, in aspects of agriculture but looking at it as an opportunity for um, se essentially setting up businesses which will then go on to employ people and all the rest of it. So this was started in Ibadan in 2012 and has been really developing since then and is now rolling out actually to a lot of countries um, across Africa again in support from the African Development Bank. It was formed, so it was really essentially in the beginning that the whole idea was to start to, to mobilize um, some of these youth, to train them, to coach them, but really to, to get into this this mindset, if you, if you like, of going into agriculture, which is not necessarily a career which appeals a lot um, to young people, but to go into agriculture as a way of developing businesses, not necessarily in production, but along uh, the value chain of agribusinesses. As I say, skill development, to think about using a improved technology, to think about the value chain, think about what alliances and partnerships would be needed to set up such uh, programs and businesses. And this is now really starting to, to pay off, as we can see. A number of these um, agripreneurs are now actually going out and are developing uh, viable enterprises. Uh, this is not just in Nigeria now, it, it's uh, different parts of Africa, as I mentioned, Kenya and so forth as well, a number of places. I don't know if I have a map somewhere. Yeah, so it's been replicated in, in different parts of, of Africa now, and it is growing, and it's still something which is really only just getting started, but it's now receiving significant support from the African Development Bank. And the idea is that these people will be trained to the stage where they can develop their own business plan, uh, and that will go to um, essentially to banks, but with some support from the African Development Bank um, to really try and overcome, overcome some of the, the challenges that young people uh, typically face. And one of the main challenges that they, they face is really access to financial services. And, you know, in some ways the reluctance of, of providers of financial services to, to give them loans, to, 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 to look at them as a good prospect, if you like, for, for loans which can get uh, repaid. So there's a, a sort of package which has been put in place, which is partly grants, will be partly loans to allow this sort of development and to overcome some of the other challenges as well that you face in terms of getting into agriculture. 
So that's basically, you know, one way that IIT, again, with a lot of partners, obviously, uh, the federal government, the major partners, state government, the partners, <coughs> is trying to overcome this, is trying to develop maybe a slightly different, um, you know, slightly more innovative approach uh, to capacity development within agriculture to address some of the major issues that we have, and as I say, depends on really a mindset change and the way that young people look at agriculture and look at their own possible futures within agriculture, relies on institutional support and it's very focused into, into business uh, development uh, rather than, if you like, more traditional areas of agricultural productivity. So, I think this is even my last slide. Oh. So, it's, it's it's, it's become something, as I say, which has expanded, has led to a number of different businesses. Of course, at the moment, it, it's, it's still small, but I think, and I say, we think, you know, it's a sort of model. It still has a strong link uh, to the research programs, but it's all about uh, the, the delivery of technology. It's all about, really, the use of modern technologies in an agricultural context. To build, it, to build employment opportunities and to revitalise um, agriculture and the, the potential of agriculture and the attractiveness of agriculture uh, to young people. Different um, offshoots of this have come about in, in Abuja. We have another group where we have this thing called Green Wealth on uh, agriculture. Mechanisation has become a big element of it. Fish farming has become an element of it. And overall this has uh, become really well uh, trained, if you like, into the development of business propositions, bankable business propositions that uh, investment services can put money into. Democratic Republic of Congo, to have further examples, and this is really going through to, to products which are, you know, which are available on the market. Obviously they have to go through all this. Uh, relevant registration processes and so on. So essentially what I'm, what I'm here to say is, um, well let me just deal with this slide first and then I'll recap. Uh, so in the future, as in the past, we need institutional support, we need to look at the provision of credit, we need to look at the role of mechanisation and of modern ICT, mobile phones, mobile phone apps, all those things on the networking and the development of these agribusinesses. So to summarise, basically I'm saying that IITA has a very strong uh, commitment to capacity development, to collaboration in terms of MSc level work, undergraduate work as well, PhD work, um, as I said, undergraduate IT students. We do a lot of that already. We want to do more, we want to partner with uh, the University of Lagos. In that respect, we want to partner with um, international uh, um, universities as we do now, and the uh, sort of scheme that we're talking to, to John and Ekan about the split site PhDs, uh, the professional level qualifications, the DIs, and so forth. But we also want to try and engage with partners and other organisations in bringing the youth. Of, of Nigeria and other countries um, in Africa into agriculture as a profitable business. Thank you very much. I'm blessed in my job, I travel a lot. And um, as I travel around, I get to appreciate how fortunate Nigeria is. That's very true. I cover only 25 countries in Africa. And so when the Vice Chancellor, Deputy Vice Chancellor was talking about the University of Lagos being a hub in West Africa, that's quite an interesting concept. Which, if it's ingrained into your thinking, in your process, and the way you put together research proposals, in your workflow, it put things in perspective. You've got the capacity and the potential to transform the West African region. Innovations in education. My, my doctorate degree is in environmental management. So I want to paint a quick picture for you to get a sense 
as one from the driver. It says the role of academia, industry, and government. Okay. Everyone knows the Delta area, the Naya Delta. If you're Nigerian, I don't know Naya Delta, then I think, I think there's nothing you know at all. Okay? The Naya Delta is our super house, economic mainstay. But look at this. So academia, every federal university in Nigeria, even universities in Portaco, in the Delta area, have a department of environment. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Okay. In fact, they even have even, even like uh, innovations within the department. There's master's degree in rehabilitation. I mean, the list is endless. That's academia. Take industry. The idea of health and safety and environment is ingrained into the oil and gas industry. They speak it, they dream it. In fact, it's become like a Bible. So when they want to do any, any I mean, it's, it's, it's almost incredible. Any, any meeting, they have to get an observation of HSC. It's ingrained. That's industry. Now, in government, there's the Federal Ministry of Environment, and there's the State Ministry of Environment. And I, if I begin to mention the numbers of environmental agencies, both at federal and state level, you will be shocked. We might spend the whole day here. So it means actually, in the environmental space, there is potential capacity, all capacity, in academia, industry, and government. But how come the Delta area remains one of the most polluted environments in the world until tomorrow gas flaring remains perpetual? There's a reason why. It's because these guys don't talk to each other. There is no communication. The government says, well, we have power, so come to us. Academia says, well, we have knowledge, well, come to us. And industry says, well, we have money, you come to us. But as long as nobody goes to the other, well, nothing happens. <laughs> Africa has got big challenges, and I mean real challenges, enough to make it think. 600 million people on the continent don't have access to electricity. Just think about that for a minute. Okay? In Nigeria alone, the water aid data says that 57 million people in Nigeria don't have access to clean and safe water. I think that's staggering. In Ghana, in Kenya, 45,000 people die in Nigeria every year from diarrhea. I want to get you to think that we have problems. Every year, Africa contributes about 17 million tons of waste. And it's projected by 2025, we'll be eating 160 million. And of that amount, less than 10% is even being considered for recycling. Now, for a continent with a billion people, I'm projected to hit 2.3 billion by 2050, surpassing China and Nigeria, surpassing the US in population. It brings together some interesting dynamics. Did you know that by 2030, that's literally like 13 years from now, Africa would have the largest working population of young people in the world. Uganda has got the second youngest population in the world. In fact, data shows that 70% of a 40 million people population are less than 30 years old. Think about that for a minute. We've got issues. Enough to make researchers consider problems as the first consideration before you put together a proposal. I was involved in a review with the British Council. I think it was last year. And we assessed about, I think, 15 Nigerian universities. Trying to understand what is the priority, if you like, uh, primer for African or Nigerian researchers to do research. And you know what the results show? It's promotion. No, 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 get, get me right, that, that's fine. That's actually fine. Promotion was the basic primer. 
But the question is this. Can you have promotion and still solve problems? You actually can. Let me give you a sense. Imagine tomorrow the NUC put a policy that as part of your promotion, you must show a basis by, by specific statistics quantifying how your research has a cost impact. You would see the level of innovation and competition that will set it. So it means a simple policy shift. A simple policy shift can change dynamics. Imagine if Tech Fund, the biggest funding body in the country around tertiary education, made a requirement that every student or researcher who applies for Tech Fund, you must show specifically a liaison affiliation with the company as the requirement. It will drive some innovation. We've got challenges, that's fine. It's around peace and tranquility and infrastructure and ICT. But see, Africa, notice I keep saying Africa, because for me, I think Nigeria is too small. I think you, you've got a, a capacity by way of your research, your work, to impact the continent. Okay? So there's issues and challenges, access to finance and, and, and obviously corruption and again workforce. But I think for me, the big one is the dynamics between knowledge, money, and power, and how you can bridge those gaps for change. Because it has impact on employability. I mean, let me give an example. So I finished in zoology, my first degree, and John was very kind. John was saying how going to a very, a very true changed my life. My parents are here in the audience, and there is no way There is no way you are able to afford going to the UK to go and study. I remember when I went to my dad and said, oh, by the way, I got a full scholarship, all expenses paid, to go and study in the UK. He was crying. He said, but it changed my life. Now listen very carefully. And I'm also conscious because in the audience we've got professors, but for me, I'll tell you the truth, because the young people are the future of the continent. So I know in the room as students, so I'm trying as much as possible to balance my talk. You know, when I came in here, I had a massive presentation. But listening to Professor John and Michael and get, getting a sense of the audience, I want to just speak plainly if I may. There is opportunities beckoning in Africa. Africa is going through an economic renaissance. In the last four years alone, at least 25 countries are starting to explore natural resources. I've been in meetings in Tanzania where they will say, can you arrange for a study tour for us to come and understand how Nigeria has worked with the oil and gas industry? The list is endless. So how do you work in collaboration? If that is a fundamental issue. Now, so, so my view of some issues, because obviously my talk is about innovations in education. You have to think outside the box. Every year, NUC tells us, 1.8 million people apply for job to get into universities. Nigerian high education carrying capacity is about 600,000. That means every year, at least a million people are continuously looking for where to study. Where do they go? I tell you where they go. They go to Benin Republic. They go to Mali. Nigerians actually go and study French first before they begin their first degree. See what? Five years ago, or six years ago, the NUC put together a policy on distance learning, which is like a framework to get Nigerian institutions to start thinking innovatively around flexible ways of education provision. Till now, you can count them. Out of 150 Nigerian universities, there are less than five universities that have got top, robust distance learning offerings in the country after five years. So our education supply doesn't meet demand. It, it, it requires innovation in education offers. Oh, let's talk about pri private universities. We were driving to Ibadan yesterday, and uh, it was quite interesting. As we drove, literally every other, I don't know, mile or something, there was a university <laughs> on the road. There is mountain top and mountain down. And <laughs> 
there is a rebellious, there's Christopher University, I mean, it's all over the place. Yeah. I mean, I deal with the NUC, they still tell us, even with all of that, we cannot deal with the math. And for me, that's quite crucial. Because to solve our challenges, the university is a robust environment to make a difference. And you can't work in isolation. And that's the question. There is just a new rule. When last did you put a proposal together as a researcher? And you consider, for example, you are in the Faculty of Education. When last did you put a proposal together and you consider inviting somebody from the business school on a proposal? We haven't even been able to work within universities. How much more working outside of it? Yes. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Okay? Now, I use zoology. For my first job of working in a bank. <laughs> and I know a banker whose first job was working in a pharmacist. Nigeria has the largest telecoms market in Africa, yet less than five universities offer a master's in telecoms management. Mm. Nigeria has been producing oil and gas for the last 40 years. Until tomorrow, over 70% of graduates of ZAR in our oil and gas industry school in Scotland. Mm. Nigeria has the largest, well, third largest production of movies movie industry in the world after Bollywood and Hollywood. Until tomorrow, there are less than five universities that offer a top-notch film course, master's degree level. Mm. Okay, now the government said, well, that's fine. Let's divert towards agriculture as the next, next day. That's fantastic. But you know what? Every university I know in Nigeria offers agriculture as a course. But less than five percent of agricultural graduates do anything agricultural. I want to get you thinking. There's a massive global drive around the environment, sustainability, the SDGs, the Paris Agreement. It's a big agenda. Everybody is asking, how do I align my company, myself, with the SDGs, with being sustainable? Every university I know in Nigeria, as far as I know, have one program or the other in environmental management. For less than 5% of environmental graduates do anything environmental. Mm. So like I put it in a post on LinkedIn not too long ago. It's almost like the things we need, we don't have. The things we have, we don't need. Mm. Now the things we need and have, we don't use. <laughs> it gets you thinking why, as a researcher, as a student, as an administrator, you need to innovate in education provision because we've got big problems. And we cannot wait for people outside and Nigeria to and throw. And I love my country. We have to solve our problems. And the bedrock is a, an amazing international education provision. Okay? The dilemma of polytechnics is an interesting one. Everybody regards HMD holders as the people with chicken pox. Don't touch them. And interestingly, people know actually, practically, that HMD holders do better than graduates on many levels, especially in the technical sphere. So it sounds like there should be a policy dimension around the balancing effect. The, sh the issue with MOUs and partnerships. There's a reason why I'm here today. Why I work with Adversity University. It's a university who has figured out how to internationalize. It's not your average university in the middle of London. Many people go to, go to the UK, go to London. So to start with, the university is out of town, literally at the end, you know what I mean, like at the end of somewhere. But guess what? Constantly has over 70, international students from 70 countries represented in the university. Why do they keep coming? Professor Greta was telling me about this year, the university was the best university in the year in teaching quality. That is something they are doing right. 
Now, to drive this bridge, if you like, between academia, industry, and government, to balance the effect, and to create a very suitable environment for quality education provision, you cannot do it with a strategic partnership. The reason is very simple. You can't do everything on your own. But guess what? In my survey, every federal university I know has got one MOU or the other. Oh, trust me, they are gathering dust on the shelves. Mm -hmm. Less than 5% of MOU signed ever get out of the shelf. Mm -hmm. So even the, the, the offer to resolve the issue is kept in the dark. <laughs> when you ask somebody, you know, being a teacher, is it a good thing? There's always this feeling that, you know, you know how it is when I was growing up. Don't worry, the reward of a teacher is in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't need to hear you. you just, don't, the reward of a teacher is in heaven. You know, UK universities now develop business plans. You, I, I thought you hear that in corporate bodies. Okay? UK universities now have departments of business development. I said university, not company. Because in a global world where there is limited finance, but so much big problems to solve for people need to be innovative. How do you drive operationalizing of MOUs? How do you drive quality research? How do you drive quality teaching? These are questions that have to come into innovations in research. Look at the tech fund. These are big grants. They spend it for students in Nigeria to go and spend three, four years overseas. But the question is this. Do they really have to spend three, four years in the UK? I mean, if you did a PhD, you know, your PhD is broken into three. There's your literary review, there's your core research, data gathering, and there's your write-up. And so models like Professor John explained around split-site PhDs, or flexible PhDs, or professional PhDs, is to make it easy for you to get access to quality education at low cost, but still solving the issue of brain drain. Whilst the co in encouraging collaborations for correction of research, that is what the University of Aberystwyth brings to the table. Okay? Gaps. I was talking about researchers. So, in the particular year, the AFDB showed clearly that out of documentations that were cited by research in the Africa, South Africa was number one with 107,000 documents cited. Tunisia was second, or Tunisia was third, Nigeria was second. Guess what? The exact same year, look at what was cited in Japan. The exact same year, Nigeria was struggling with 35,000 documents. 1.6 million was cited in Japan, and 1.1 in the US. It's research for impact, innovative research. Now, this is a representation of the world global patents map. Africa is missing. Mm -hmm. Have you seen it? It's all those globals you see. It's a representation of the size of the global is a factor of impact of research. Africa is not almost non-existent. This next map shows it even better. Africa is not there at all. But the question is, does it mean you don't have research in Africa, in Nigeria? We do. But there's no conversation between research and research use. And so you can design your product, educational. For me, education is a, a service offering, but it can also be an innovative product. Think about Coca-Cola. Before Coca-Cola had Coca-Cola, that's nice Coke. Then afterwards, there were people who were watching their weight, so they had diet Coke. Then after a while, there were people who were watching their weight but liked strawberry. So they had diet Coke with strawberry. strawberry. Mm. Innovating on demand. Why can't education be innovative? I want to end the presentation about getting you to think about models of collaboration. I want to begin with the student internship. A, a portfolio at Versus University has cracked really well. It's getting students to be responsible for their lives by way of research, by way of internships. Now, I don't mean internships where a master's degree student 
in economics. He would go and work in a company as a student intern, and all he does all week is serve tea. That's not what I mean. I mean studentship driven by specific projects. Let me give you an example of a model. You, if you contact companies, do you have an idea of a research area, a project, uh, an issue? You want your company, especially they are SMEs, because SMEs are too poor to pay for R&D. Write it together into a product or a project. Okay, give it to us. Now, I don't, I, I can't think of an SME that will say no to that, but you would know because you have an ask. They give it to you, and you advertise that research project as a decision topic for your master's degree student or your bachelor's degree student. So you find a student doing a research project where a company is in a hurry to get the results when they finish it. That is an innovative way of student internships or co-projects that can drive actual impact, but also increase availability. An example is actually a portfolio called KESS, that's the Knowledge Economy Skills Scholarship sponsored by the World Government. But that's just my point, driven by policy to, come, to make that navigation between academia and industry work better. And so they identified four key areas, ICT, licenses and health, low carbon energy and environment, and advanced engineering as a focus area for those projects. And people have to apply for them. But whoever gets the project takes many buttons. I'll give you an example. I've mentioned specific areas in country untouched. Maritime, oil and gas, telecommunications. So when I heard several years ago now, I think it's about three, three or four years ago, when the, 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 the government at the time opened eight new universities, I was excited. I said, that's fantastic. Because it means actually we can begin to bridge the gap between education supply and demand. And then I discovered that they've gone back to start offering the same courses the old ones were offering. Zoology. Who knows of any existing zoo in country right now? <laughs> Does that make sense? So it's getting, getting bigger than the boss about innovation. And so the idea of co-application of international research grants. Because someone always asks me, I'll wrap up in a minute. Who asks me, well, if there's academia, industry, and government, and it's important they work together, the question is who drives the conversation? In an ideal world, policy and governments, government drives the conversation. But in an unideal world, the question is who drives the conversation? You know how I respond to that? The person who knows the benefit of the communication drives the conversation. So you get out of your office and go meet the company. Don't expect them to come to you. Trust me, these guys already have some ego trip. Because they can't operate in your knowledge space. They might have money. So it's a massive ego trip in that relationship. But how do you know that they're not your enemies? That actually the industry likes you. You know how you know? It's a simple test. Just send that guy a letter, that CEO, and offer him a honorary doctorate degree. You won't sleep. <laughs> You've made his life. You've made his day. So on some level, he likes you. Only he hasn't figured out a way to work with you. So researchers have to be innovative. Go out there. When you're having a meeting or a small event of some sort, and you want to engage companies, don't do it in the university. Go to a hotel or somewhere. Because you're the one who knows the benefit of the association. Go apply for a research grant. I'm yet to see, and I've done it several times, I'm yet to see a CEO have approached to say, come and teach on a course who has said no. You know how big a honor that is? Mm. That you are inviting him to come and teach on a master's degree course. So there are models of collaboration, co-development, co-location, get them to have offices in the university. As a basis, but there has to be a massive building. I want to end with this. As I travel around different universities, I discover something quite interesting. Every university I know has something similar, and it's all over the, the country. In fact, it's actually all over Africa. They've got commercial banks with offices in universities. So I did a small research. I started asking different vice chancellors and said, were you the one who invited the bank to come to the university? I've asked at least four, about 
for two verses of those till date. Just like, like kind of jokingly. And no, none of them have told me that they were the one who invited the company to the university. You know why? Industry will go with the value. Whether you invite them or not. So create a platform for collaboration. Thank you very much.